So did you notice the word danger? It occurs eight times in verse 26. In danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. The Apostle Paul had a dangerous job. What are the most dangerous jobs in the world? I searched this on the internet and found quite a few lists of the world's most dangerous jobs. Here's one list, top 10 most dangerous jobs in the world. Some you'd expect, some maybe will surprise you. Number 10, electrical power line technicians. Number nine, firefighters. Eight, metal workers. Seven, landmine removal specialists. Six, oil field workers. Number five, flight engineers and aircraft pilots. Number four is roofers. Number three, miners. Second on the list is deep sea fishers. And finally, number one, most dangerous job according to this world, or according to this list, most dangerous job in the world, number one, loggers and lumberjacks. So, did anyone, or has anyone, or is anyone doing one of those jobs? All right, a few. I did some roofing, but you wouldn't call me a roofer. Uh, on another list, there was uh, construction laborers, which I did do uh, a few summers, uh, but didn't make this list. But why do people do these dangerous jobs? Well, some, I think, are rewarding, like firefighter. Like a firefighter, it's, uh, it's rewarding to, to save someone. It's, uh, it's a job that people admire. Uh, some of these jobs probably earn someone quite a bit of money, so that's a motivation. Others, though, like, for example, roofers or construction laborers, which wasn't on the list but was on another list, uh, I could think of myself, why, why was I motivated to do that job? Well, I was just desperate for a job. Uh, I wasn't getting a lot of money, $5 an hour. Why would I do it? Well, I was just going to do anything I could get paid to do. Just needed some money back in the days when I was going to uh, Bible college. I needed to make some money in the summer. So uh, sometimes people just, just need to make some money, and so they can do that job, and that's the motivation. Uh, why they do these dangerous jobs. Different motivations, but what about the Apostle Paul? He talks about being in all of this danger. Why was Paul willing to face the dangers of being an apostle of Jesus Christ? Think about that. We'll get back to that question in a bit. But we need to think about what's, what's going on, why Paul is writing these things. In chapters 10 through 13, Paul uh, defends himself. That's what he's doing in this passage. Uh, there are some in Corinth, in the church at Corinth, who are critical of Paul. Uh, he talks about how some have entered the church. He calls them, in, uh, earlier in this chapter, false apostles. They're, they're teaching another Jesus, a different gospel, a uh, very serious matter. Uh, and uh, these, these false apostles are, are criticizing Paul, putting him down, and some in the church are going along with that criticism. And one of the criticisms concerning Paul was that Paul is weak. Paul mentions this in chapter 10, verse 10. Some people in Corinth are saying that Paul's letters are, are weighty and strong, but his, his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. So he, he, in his letters, wrote like a, like a tough guy, but when he arrived in Corinth, he didn't look very, very strong, very tough. Uh, he wasn't, uh, in their minds, a great speaker. Uh, I don't think that Paul was a bad preacher. There is the incident in Acts where someone falls asleep and falls out a window, but uh, 
I think that had to do with the length of the sermon and probably the young man was tired at the moment. But I think he was a good speaker, but he wasn't a trained speaker. And uh, in that culture, a great speaker was more like a performer, an actor, than speaking from one's heart. And so Paul uh, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't appear to be, in their minds, a great preacher. So he was criticized as being in weak for these reasons and others. Now, if you were being criticized for being weak, how would you defend yourself? Well, Paul defends himself in an unusual way. He defends himself by boasting about his weakness. Look at verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And then he continues on uh, down in verses 32 and 33 at Damascus. This was at the very, really, start of his ministry as an apostle. At Damascus, kind of set the tone for the rest of his ministry. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Now, back then... The first Roman soldier to scale a wall, a city wall in battle, earned a badge of courage. Now, Paul, on the other hand here, was lowered down a wall while hiding in a basket. So this is an example of of Paul's weakness. He didn't storm out of the city in a courageous way. He hid in a basket and was lowered down the wall. So why does Paul boast in his weakness? How is that defending himself as an apostle? Well, and he'll go on to say this in chapter 12 as well. Paul's weakness really reveals that God's power is working through him. In some ways, he's weak, but the power of God is revealed in that He is able to serve Christ in many ways. Most notably, going from place to place, preaching the gospel, and and people are being saved and churches are being formed. Really, our weakness can reveal that God's power is working through us. Paul, when he writes that He faces all of these dangers as an apostle. He isn't saying, look at how brave I am. He's saying, look at how great God is. He's not boasting about himself. He's boasting in the Lord, as he talks about in chapter 10, verse 17. And so, like Paul, who was weak in different ways, we today are weak in some ways. But we should never think that God can't accomplish anything through us. We should never think that we're too weak for that, not, not talented enough, not, uh, not strong enough. The all-powerful God doesn't need strong people. He just needs people who, who recognize their weakness and rely upon God's power, not their own. Strength can actually become a liability if we rely on our own talent, our own abilities, our own charisma. Uh, You see some very talented people in the church fall, fall into sin, fall into error. Perhaps some of that has to do with relying on one's own strength. Weakness leads us to rely on God and His power. As Paul writes in chapter 12, verse 10, when I am weak, then I am strong. And so God doesn't need strong people. He just needs people who recognize that they need God's power in their life. And uh, He's able to use us. He's able to work in us and through us. And so that's why Paul boasted in his weakness. 
Yes, I'm weak in several areas, but God's power can be seen working through me, through my ministry. And so that is a reason why you can see that God is with me. Weak in some ways, but God's power working through me. So let's get back to that question of uh, why did Paul do this job, this dangerous job as an apostle, going from place to place, encountering all sorts of problems, suffering in many ways. Look at, look at verse 23. We're not going to get to all of the verses in this passage. Verse 23, he starts to talk about uh, his weakness and, his, and the dangers and the suffering. Are they servants of Christ? They, meaning the false apostles who are uh, putting Paul down, teaching false teaching. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. Now, he says, I'm talking like a madman. So clearly Paul is uncomfortable defending himself in this way. He talks about speaking like a fool. So this isn't how Paul would naturally talk. He wouldn't naturally defend himself by listing all of his uh, qualifications. But he's kind of forced into doing this because that's what's being done uh, to him. And so he has to show them how he is qualified as an apostle. So uh, some commentators call this the fool's speech. Uh, Paul recognizes that. He's not talking as he normally would. Uh, So uh, I'm talking like a madman, he says, verse 23, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Uh, Just continuing on, he says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. That would be flogging with a whip. That was the most severe punishment that could be given under Jewish law. Uh, Three times, verse 25, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. Uh, Some of these things you can read about in the book of Acts, some are not included in that book. Verse 26, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, that would be the Jews, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In other words, wherever he went, there was danger. Verse 27, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And then he adds, and apart from these, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches, including the church at Corinth. So he's willing to to experience all of this danger. He's willing to, to suffer. And and how do the troubles and dangers in Paul's ministry prove that he's a better servant of Christ than these other apostles, these false apostles? Well, it's not the suffering, it's not the suffering alone. Just suffering in and of itself doesn't make us uh, a faithful servant of Christ. But the fact that he is willing to suffer for people like the Corinthians shows us his motivation, shows us why he was willing to to go through all of this and face all of these dangers. And the reason, the motivation is love. First, love for Christ. He's a servant of Christ. And as a servant of Christ, as an apostle, he's serving people. So he's motivated by love for Christ and also love for people. And really that Today, we're not apostles, but uh, for all of us, and we've talked already in 2 Corinthians how all of us uh, as believers are to be involved in ministry of some sort, serve the Lord, serve others, and that is to be our motivation as well, love, love for Christ, love for people. Now, the false apostles in Corinth, they aren't willing to suffer for the Corinthians, Instead, Paul mentions in verse 20 that they, that they take advantage of the Corinthians. 
They want control over the Corinthians. That's their motivation, what they can get from the people. But Paul is motivated by love. He is looking at what he can give. And earlier in this chapter, he talks about how he didn't even receive money for his service from the Corinthians. He could have, but he chose not to. And it uh, shows again that his motivation was not money or anything of that nature, what he could get from them, but what he could give. He was motivated by love, love for Christ and love for people. So Paul is willing to suffer because he knows that, that Christ was willing to suffer for him. Uh, Christ is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Uh, that passage we read earlier, we read part of it. Uh, he's the man of sorrows. Christ is. He's the one who was willing to bear the iniquity of us all. And why was Christ willing to suffer for us? Well, he was motivated by love. That was Paul's motivation, motivated by love. That's why he was willing to go through all of these things he mentions in these verses. And what about us today? Are we willing to go through any hardships for Christ and for others, face any danger? A servant of Christ, and if we're a believer, if we receive salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, then we should consider ourselves a servant of Christ. A servant of Christ should be willing to suffer, motivated by love. Are we like Paul? Do we have that same motivation? He had a dangerous job, but he was willing to do it because he was motivated by love. We, as servants of Christ, do we have that same motivation? Motivated by love for Christ and love for people. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. I just wanted to share a few verses before we do this. 2 Corinthians the next, well, a couple of chapters later in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, uh, Paul talks about how Christ was crucified in weakness. And so Paul wanted to really embody the life of Christ. Paul was willing to be seen as weak as Christ was seen as weak, crucified in weakness. Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This word of the cross, this message, the gospel, is seen by so many as, as foolishness, as silly, but we see it as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, We considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. That's what his enemies thought. As he was dying on that cross, they saw him as being punished by God. And so Jesus was willing to be uh, misunderstood by those around him, rejected, mocked, and uh, That'll happen to us sometimes as his followers, to be misunderstood, to be uh, ridiculed, mocked. Are we willing to suffer in these ways for him as he was for us? Uh, the gospel is not a story of foolishness or weakness. As I said, in it we see the power of God, the wisdom of God. So as we eat this bread, as we drink this cup, let's remember that Christ was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And let's also remember that Christ, as, as Peter writes in alluding to this passage in Isaiah 53, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness.